Let's go to the Lord once again as we come to his word. Well, Heavenly Father, we come to you as a needy people this morning. Father, this is a solemn gathering before a holy God, and we desperately need your aid as we come to your word to hear what you have to speak to us this morning. And so, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would move amongst us, would open our hearts and our minds to receive your word as by the power of your spirit you renew us, Lord. Father, we're grateful for your word and we ask for your help. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We should already be in Ephesians chapter 4. You know we're going to be there for a long time as we make our way through the text intentionally, slowly. We are still in verses 1 through 3. Let me read those to us again this morning. Paul writes, Therefore I... The prisoner in the Lord exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, in this passage, we've been discussing, uh, sorry, discussing the characteristics of the worthy walk. In the first verse, we see here the Apostle speaks of the fact that every Christian is expected to live in a certain way, is expected to walk in a certain way. We spoke of the word worthy in the text in that that word means more literally bringing up the other beam of scales. That's what the Greek word there means. Worthy means to bring up the other beam of scales. In other words... The worthy walk is balancing the scales of our position in Christ with our lifestyle. To walk worthy means the scales are not unbalanced, but that your life adequately reflects your profession of faith. If you claim to be a Christian, in other words, you strive then to live like a Christian. Now, as we look at the text this morning, I want us to notice that these characteristics that we read in our passage are not so much things that we are to do, but they are rather ways in which we are meant to be. The apostle gives us five character traits. And they're not merely items on a list to be checked off. And I think that's one of the dangers in modern Christianity that we can become merely moralistic. What does God require? Check the box, move on. He says to walk a worthy walk, and it's one that's rooted in humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, and diligence to preserve unity. But sometimes we get so focused on what we have to check off that we forget who we are, who we're meant to be, and sometimes we forget the whole point of Christianity and the danger is that we fall into legalism though we are commanded to obey. Now obviously, Christians are moral people. But I want to remind you as we go through this text that morals are not our focus, Christ is. We don't want to convert people to moralism. We want them to come to Christ. Good morals don't save us. Christ does. And the Great Commission isn't to get everyone to be more moral. It's to make disciples of Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of age. One pastor says this about moralism. He says, it misrepresents the divine message that man, moral or immoral, is damned and must be saved, and can be saved only by believing the gospel. The Apostle Paul has just been telling us in previous chapters of God's glorious grace, which he bestowed on us through Christ. In chapter 1, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And now here in chapter 4, Paul gets really practical. He gets really practical. But what he gives us is not merely a list of to-dos in order to walk a worthy walk. Rather, what he gives us is what the character results are to be because we are in Christ. And so this changes not just what we are to do, the gospel that is, but more importantly, it changes who we are. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, indulging in the desires of the flesh. And the text tells us in chapter 2 that we were by nature children of wrath, but now we are a new creation. We're no longer dead, but alive. We're no longer slaves of sin, but now adopted as sons and daughters of God. And therefore, the apostle says, walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And so the worthy walk, dear church, is about your character. And from your character, you then act. So last week we discussed the very first characteristic Paul mentions here, which is humility. And though we covered it last week, humility is so fundamental to the character of the Christian that I wanted to return to it this morning, but from a slightly different angle. Andrew Murray once gave a stunning definition of humility. Let me read it to you. He says this, he says, and I quote, Humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret and am at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all around and above is trouble. The humble person is not one who thinks meanly of himself. He simply does not think of himself at all. End quote. If only we can learn to be humble, we'll know what it is to be Christ-like. And I hope that that becomes your prayer this morning as we consider our text, that you will be one who thinks of himself less and thinks of others more. Not insisting on your ways, not insisting on your preferences, not insisting on your rights, but thinking always of others before yourself. It's no mistake that the apostle mentions humility first. These are a sort of progressing traits. And if you'll look at the text, you'll kind of see that one really leads to the other. And so without humility, you can't have gentleness truly. Which then leads to patience and forbearing or tolerance and so forth and so on. And so humility really is the key to walking the worthy walk. If you'll recall last week, we said that the word humility here means to think or to judge with lowliness and hence to have lowliness of mind. Let me give you that definition again. To think or judge with lowliness and hence to have lowliness of mind. In other words, it's to think little of yourself. No, not in a self-pity sense. But just simply realizing that you are no better than others. You deserve no more than others and are not offended easily by others. Humility will always have the tendency to elevate others above itself in terms of value and worth and preference and dignity. It really is a countercultural idea. We spoke last week of the fact that Paul really coined this term. In the days Paul wrote this, there was no word for humility. 
And in fact, the philosophers of the day, which we said also last week, put humility as the first quality that you did not want to have. Because pride is what they were after. Well, I would argue that we aren't any different today because pride is what most often reflects our natural sinful human state. And it's also true then that humility may, may be one of the most difficult virtues because it's against our sinful nature and the world loves pride. We know that. We have a whole month now on the calendar that says what? Pride. Everything about our culture tells you that you ought to have pride in yourself. And I hope I can squash that idea this morning. In fact, I did a quick internet search on pride. And there's no shortage of articles and books and such that teach us that we're supposed to be proud of ourselves. In fact, let me just read a couple of the headlines I found to you. One was, how to be proud of yourself and why it is so important. I like that. 26 reasons to be proud of yourself. 11 steps to be more proud of yourself. This is like going to a meeting and giving you steps week by week how to be more arrogant. Three reasons you should feel proud of yourself. Well, these are some of the headlines. So I decided to click on a few of those lists and see what they say. I'm curious now, how, what are some of these steps? How is it that we should feel proud about ourselves? Here are a few things some of them offered. The first one said this, with all the goals you've accomplished in life, whether big or small, you should be proud of yourself for everything. Well, that sounds a bit like everyone gets a participation trophy. Here's another one. Even the most mundane accomplishments can lead you to extraordinary places in life, which is why you should never underestimate yourself. Well, that'd make a great fortune cookie. Number three, you've survived a lot of things. That's it. That's the reason you should be proud of yourself. Well, congratulations. The salmon that makes it up the stream survived a lot of things too. You are resilient in every situation. And the last one, you never stopped dreaming no matter the situation. Well, sadly, you could probably hear some of those in pulpits across the country today. And you could go on and on with the list, but that sounds nothing like the attitude of Jesus. And that's what I want to compare it to. Here, we have the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ, fully God. And He doesn't say He's proud because He's accomplished a lot of things. What does Christ say? He doesn't say He's proud and worthy because he's never stopped dreaming. Now listen to Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Speaking of Jesus, we read who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What a contrast. The God of heaven humbled himself to come down like us as a man that we might be saved. A stark contrast. If anyone had the right to be genuinely proud, it would be God. It would be Christ. But no, it says He humbled Himself. And so this morning I'd like to ask you, who do you wish to be like? Do you want to be like Christ? Or do you want to be like the world? And that's a question that has to be answered. We are to imitate Christ, of course, 
And here is one area that we see such a stark contrast between the ways of the world and the ways of God. And Paul's going to be doing this for the next two chapters, saying, if you're a Christian, this is the way to walk, not this way. It is two chapters of us, believers versus them, the world. And he's teaching us how to be like Christ, how to walk the worthy walk. The world says to be proud. Pat yourself on the back. You're the best. Give that man a trophy. Christ says humble yourself. In humility, we should understand who we truly are and see ourselves in a lowly manner. Again, not a self-pity sense, but to understand who we are in relation to fellow men and to God. And so we come to the point where we now understand that we're to be humble. And you're saying, okay, preacher, I get that. We're to be humble. But now here's the question, how do I do that? How do I obtain humility? Well, dear friend, if you ever come to the conclusion that you've obtained humility, you've just lost it. But how do we pursue a life of humility? And that's the question that I want to answer. But before that, I want to look at God's response to pride. Last week we went to the book of Isaiah and we spoke briefly of Satan's fall. If you'll recall those five I will statements that Satan makes, statements of pride. I want to give you another example this week. And so if you will, why don't you just turn with me to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus in chapter 5. We're going to flip around a little this morning. And you'll know the story. Verse 1, And afterwards Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh, that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. And also, I will not let Israel go. There you have it. What a statement of pride. Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? Pharaoh says. Well, in the preceding verses, we see the plagues. Waters turn to blood, the frogs over the land, the plague of flies, the death of all the Egyptian cattle, the plague of boils, the plague of hail. And then we come to chapter 10 and listen to what God has to say in verse 3. Then Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. You know, isn't it interesting? Do we not sometimes respond to God similarly? You know, we always like to put ourselves as the heroes in the text, but normally that's not the case. How do we do that? Well, sometimes we respond to God in pride, much like Pharaoh. And one common way is that we insist on worshiping God the way we want, rather than looking to the Word It's the difference between the regulative principle of worship, and you know that term by now, versus the normative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship says, what does God want from the church, from His people, in worship to Him, and that and that alone we do. The regular principle says, let's just do what we want, as long as the text doesn't forbid it. And so this is where you get silly things like fog machines, And rock concerts. But really and truly that's nothing more than people doing the same thing Pharaoh did. Refusing to humble themselves before God. And of course we know that Pharaoh remained proud, right? And God in the end destroyed him. Well, here's another example. It's a bit more lengthy, but it's worth looking at this morning. Turn with me to the book of Daniel, if you will. 
If you're not sure where Daniel is, if you'll find Isaiah and just move uh, four books to the right, you'll be in Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to read a lengthy passage to us this morning, and I want you to stay with me, so maybe follow along or put your eyes on the text. Daniel 4. I'll start in verse 4. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. You know the story. We read, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my head kept alarming me. So I gave a decree to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they may make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in and said, and I said the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. So here's the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. He's had this dream. It's disturbed his soul deeply, and he's calling for anyone and everyone to come and give him the interpretation. In verse 8, but at last Daniel came in before me. You know Daniel whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And though Nebuchadnezzar, as you can see, doesn't really know the one true God, yet he realizes there is something unique about Daniel. He says, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, no mystery is too difficult for you. Say to me the visions of my dream which I have seen, along with its interpretation. Now these were the visions in my head as I lay on the bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky inhabited its branches, and all flesh fed itself from it. And I was looking in my vision as I lay my head on my bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. And he called out loudly and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its root in the earth, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man, and let the heart of a beast be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This edict is by the resolution of the watchers. And the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and gives it to whom he wishes and sets up over it the lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Balthasar, say to me its interpretation, inasmuch as none of the wise men in my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but for you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts were alarming him. And the king answered and said, Belteshazzar, do not let, your, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, if only the dream apply to those who hate you, and its interpretation to your ad adversaries. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which there was food for all, under which the beasts of the field inhabited and in whose branches the birds of the sky dwelt, it is you, O king." For you have become great and grown strong, and your greatness has become even greater in the reach to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. But in that the king saw a watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump 
in its roots in the earth, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time passed over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is what we want to get to. This is the resolution of the Most High, which has reached my Lord the King, that you be driven away from mankind and your place of habitation be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like cattle, and you be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High is powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and gives it to whomever He wishes. And in that, they said to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Your kingdom will endure for you after you know that it is heaven that rules with power. Therefore, O king, may my advice seem good to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be prolonging of your prosperity. All this reached Nebuchadnezzar the king. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So he's been given the interpretation. There's 12 months here. And he's walking on the roof of the palace. After all of this, verse 30, the king answered and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal house by the strength of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is said, the kingdom has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind, and your place of habitation will be in the beast, with the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind, and gives it to whomever He wishes. So an angel comes, gives the message to King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 33, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was accomplished, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. What a picture. Uh, this is real. This isn't just metaphorical that's happened. Nebuchadnezzar has been made into a madman, where he's now on all fours eating grass like the cattle, his hair growing, his nails growing. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes toward heaven, and my knowledge returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. Well, isn't that interesting? It would have been better if he learned to humble himself before he had to pay the price. But he says, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lived forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. But He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can strike against His hand or say to Him, What have you done? And at that time, my knowledge returned to me. And my majesty and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my officials and nobles began seeking me out. And so I was reestablished in my kingdom. And extraordinary greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven. For all His works are true, and His ways are just, and He is able to humble those who walk in pride. It's a lengthy passage, but it's an incredible lesson. Nebuchadnezzar's pride literally ended him up in a field with dirt under his fingernails that had grown so long they're described as eagle's claws. He was wandering around like a madman eating grass. 
and his hair was so long that it might have made even the most unkept of hippies envious. In other words, he was a disgusting mess. And this is the attitude the world wants us to have. This is the character the world wants us to have, one that holds our heads high, even in defiance of God. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way. That's what the world wants, but we know that God says He opposes the proud. Now, I said I want to answer the question for you this morning of how to become humble, how to begin the journey to walk in humility. And so I want to give you four perspectives that we need to have in order to walk in humility. Four perspectives that you must have if you are to walk in humility. The first is a right understanding of God. A right understanding of God. The second is a right understanding of man. A right understanding of man. And then a right understanding of sin. And lastly, a right understanding of salvation. Now we're only going to get to two of these this morning. Lord willing, we'll pick up the next two next week. But first, we need a right understanding of God if we are to be humble. When we understand who God is... This is the very reason we're doing systematic theology on Wednesdays nights, to give us a bigger picture of the majesty and the grandeur of God. When we understand who God is, there's no room for pride. God is an infinite being with no beginning, no end. He's not a created being, rather, being, rather He's the creator of all beings. God is the first and the highest of all beings. Everything else that exists, exists because He created it. God is so far above man because He's infinite that we cannot even fully understand God. Psalm 145.3 says, Great is Yahweh and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. God is so grand, so magnificent, so far beyond us that we can't begin to fully comprehend Him. Not only that, but we can't even fully comprehend any one particular aspect of God. We can't fully understand His wisdom. We can't fully understand His omnipotence. We can't fully understand His omniscience. We can't fully understand His glory and His holiness. We can truly understand Him, but not fully. Romans 11.33 says it this way, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable are His ways. As humans, we tend to believe we are the apex of all beings. We tend to view ourselves as the captain of our own ship, the maker of our own destiny, the man free to make his own way when in reality, reality we are just a speck before a holy God. We're just a speck before a holy God. God is so far above us that we shouldn't dare have any pride in ourselves because God is greater and any good that we have or can do or possess was given to us by God. And so who are we to boast in anything? So when we have a right view of God, our perspective is humbled. We may be proud that we can build a house, but God built the heavens and the trillions and trillions of stars. Not only did He create them, but we call them by name. Listen to Isaiah 40, 26. It says, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number and calls them by name. Because of the greatness of His vigor and the strength of His power, not one of them is missing. Pride says, look what I can do. Look what man can do. He can build cities, great cities, complex and intricate. Look at the architecture. It's astonishing. Well, not anymore. We just build square boxes now. 
But look how we can place each building in city blocks and intertwine the roads to make travel easy. Look at all the marvelous things we can do. We can build towers that touch the clouds. Man is so great. Well, it's interesting. That's what the people of Babel thought. Listen to Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had the same language and the same words. And it happened as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered all over the face of the whole earth. Let us make for ourselves a name. That's the heart of pride. Then Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people, and they have the same language, and this is what they have begun to do. So now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Let us come down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's language. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and from there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You see, it was arrogance, the pride of the people which led them to build a tower thinking they could stretch it to the heavens. And so God confused their language and rendered them useless in their endeavors. But God doesn't just build cities. He created an entire universe and everything in it. We can build buildings, but God built the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars. God created the ocean and set its boundaries. God created the animals and decided when they give birth and when they migrate in every single detail, even to the atom. And it's all held together by the active power of God. And everything that man does... He does by the grace and gift of God. Everything that man can accomplish, everything that you are able to do, it's because God has by His grace given you the ability. And so when we understand God rightly, there's no room to be proud, to be arrogant. A right view of God will lead to a humble heart. The bigger your God, the more humble your heart. If God is just like you, but a little bit better, you'll find pride creep in. But the man who views God with holy fear, which we're told in the Proverbs, that's the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God, will be a man or a woman who is on his way to living a humble life. Number two is having the right view of man. When we have a right view of God, and we need a right view of God first, then we need a right view of man. We are first and foremost creaturely. We are creatures created by someone else. And if that isn't humbling, then consider the fact that you, my dear friends, were created out of a ball of dirt. That ought to be pretty humbling. We are created from the dirt of the earth. And then we were molded as God sees fit. And so the thing that's made can hardly have pride in itself, right? That's an absurd thought. You see a nice piece of clay pottery and I myself enjoy freshly made glass works. You've seen those beautiful crystals. You've probably seen YouTube videos of how they make those things with the melted glass on the end of these sticks, and I don't even know what they're called. And you get done, they get done, and they've blown this glass into this incredible crystal vase. And what do you say? You don't say, wow, look how that vase created itself. No. You say, look how amazing that craftsman is. And that's... The same with us. The scripture refers to us as the clay. And as God the potter. 
So God formed us. God gave us life. And nothing we do is separate from God's ultimate will and plan for our lives. It's kind of hard to be proud about something you didn't do. You didn't give yourself the gifts you have. God blessed you with them. You didn't give yourself the talents you had. God blessed you with them. And you say, well, I've certainly developed my talents. Well, that's true. But then who gave you the ability to develop your talents? God did. Not only that, but God made us then with a purpose. And we read about that purpose in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just remind you of it. In fact, if you still got your fingers there, just... Put your eyes on verse 11 and 12 in chapter 1 of Ephesians. It says, In Him we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, to the end that we who first have hoped in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. So your salvation, you were predestined. To become children of God. Not even is your salvation your own. You can't make a decision for your own salvation. That requires a work of God. But then the reason God saves us is at the end here. So that ultimately we might be to the praise of His glory. Well, how can we then boast? If our lives are meant to bring glory not to ourselves but to God. And someone then says, but I can make my own path in life. I can choose to go this way or that way. Well, Pharaoh tried that. And we saw how that went. Nebuchadnezzar thought that too. And we see where that ended him. What about the apostles who wrote the very book we're in this morning? The Apostle Paul. He too once thought he was hot stuff. He was self-righteous, adhering to the law more perfectly than those around him. In fact, listen to Paul's own account of who he was before Christ met him and his view now. Philippians 3, 5, Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And as to the law, a Pharisee. Paul saying, I was the best of the best. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which was in the law found blameless. Now, this is the height of arrogance. It's Paul describing himself before he converted. And in verse 7, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. There's nothing valuable in me above Christ. And of course, we know that God struck Paul with blindness on the road to Damascus, bringing him low and then showing him what he must suffer for the sake of Christ as the apostle to the Gentiles. And then Paul was a humbled man after that, realizing who God truly was and realizing who he was as a mere man. Well, Jonah also thought he was the captain of his own ship too. And well, he has a well of a tale from that. Man is a creature given grace, given life, given everything that he has. And without God, you could do nothing. I could do nothing. And for the believer, you've been given life twice. Once your physical life, and then you were made new, redeemed, reborn. And not because you deserved it, but because God was merciful. And it's certainly not of our own doing. We were dead, the scripture tells us. And the word dead in that passage means dead. We didn't make ourselves alive again. God did. Everything we have, we owe to God. And so how is it that we could ever 
be proud of anything. Be arrogant over anything we can do. Because it was because of God's good gift and graces that we can do what we can do. We can't even make one hair on our head black or white. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, and I can't think of any more arrogant attitude than to think that we are the ones in control. Sorry, I'll come to that later. I, I want to go to Romans 9 real quick. And you don't have to turn there. But, but I want to show you just sort of the height of pride from the New Testament. Paul says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my own brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now here we see an incredible example of humility. Paul is saying, if, if only just all the Israelites could be saved, I would even wish myself to be cursed for that to happen. That's a man laying down his life. For his fellow man. He says, Who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption of sons and the glory of the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises? Whose are the fathers and from whom the, is the Christ according to the flesh, who is God over all? Blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's seed, but through Isaac your seed will be named. That is, the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are considered as seed. For this is the word as of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. And when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that the purpose of God, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness in God? May it never be. I mean, this is just demonstrating to us man's place before God. Jacob and Esau hadn't even been born yet, and yet God said, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And then Paul anticipates the accusation of God being unjust. And so he says, is there any unrighteousness with God? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the one who wills or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. On God who has mercy. So then, He has mercy on whom He desires, and He hardens whom He desires. You will say to me then, why does He still find fault? For who resists His will? And here's Paul's response to that. The accusation of men demonstrating arrogance against God really over who he has mercy on and who he doesn't. Well, here's the answer. He says, on the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? In other words, Paul's saying, you've forgotten who you are. You are just a man. What right do you have to even question God here? He says, will the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Or does not the potter have authority over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? And what if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, having been prepared for destruction? And in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Just a few observations here. God decides who he has mercy upon and who he will have compassion upon and who he's created as a vessel either for destruction or for honor. And we certainly have human responsibility, but ultimately... 
What we need to know is men, what we have to get right about our understanding of men is that we are merely clay in the hand of a potter. And if you get that right, where is any room for pride? Because you recognize that every good thing you have comes from God. And you recognize that God is sovereign over all things and that we control nothing, truly. And so there's no room for pride. So when we understand who God is and who man is, it's, hard, it's far harder to walk in pride. It makes us low. It brings us to a place of right humility. James 4, 6 through 7 says this, But He gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Be subject therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. And so dear friends, the worthy walk is the one really and truly of right attitudes, right thinking, a right heart posture. And before you come to any of the other things that Paul is going to teach us over the next several weeks and months, humility is the foundation for all of the rest of what is required to walk a worthy walk. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful as we just consider who you are this morning and who we are as men this morning, we recognize that we are indebted to you in every way. Father, that we are the clay, and as the clay, we have no right to claim anything of our own. And Father, that humbles us. Lord, as we continue on in our day today and throughout the week, would you help us to remember constantly your grandeur, your greatness, your splendor in such a way that it humbles us continually. Father, help us to humble ourselves that we do not have to, like Nebuchadnezzar, be humbled. Father, help us to strive to live the worthy walk. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's go to the Lord.